Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode number 53, and we are calling this the Hurricane Edition. Now, if you notice, Joe Fitzpatrick is joining me. We are on the iPhone. <laughs> um, I don't have power at the house. There's no power at the studio. So our friend Marcel Semplis is lending us his office, which is very, very sweet. Um, you notice <laughs> that we are at Avenue 5 International Realty. Um, Marcel's been a friend of mine for many, many years. He's been a real estate agent or in the real estate business since 1990. He's the broker of this firm. So he's running this firm. Avenue 5 International Realty specializes in selling and finding mid-range to luxury homes in Naples, Florida. Their customers are from all over the world and their agents are international specialists. So if you're looking to buy or list your house, please consider Avenue 5 International Realty. They're lending us this beautiful space, which is very, very nice since he has power and air conditioning. Not much internet, but you know, it's just a few days after the hurricane, so whatever. <laughs> the fact that we have air at all and, you know, we're not out in the middle of the street is great. A lot of people, it's terrible this hurricane. Yeah, yeah. Now, I do want to talk about, we do have a, a new online class that's or, available for pre-order. It's going to be live on October 1st. When I was in Italy, I was in Italy, um, in fact, my life is crazy. I was in Italy until late August 31st, which is thir a Thursday night. I got home around 10, 10.30, something like that at night. And then I had to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and... Wait, we went on the boat on Monday. And yeah, then, you didn't work Monday. That's right. That was Labor Day. You're not supposed to work on Labor Day. And then Tuesday, I started editing, and they're like, oh, we're going to have a hurricane. you got to start packing up. And so I packed up, which was probably 30, 40 hours of work. Yes. And then we, we escaped. We came back, and, of course, everybody has damage. Mm -hmm. So I've been cleaning up my house. That's and I've been coming here during the day to work. So that I got most of the editing done and everything like that. But yeah, hurricanes are tough. <laughs> anyway, the surprise that Joe gave to me was that he finished this Lightroom class while I was in Italy. And it, you know, Joe already put together a really good basic Lightroom class called, called Getting Started with Lightroom. Well, this class is all about catalogs, collections, Organizing your file, what do you say? Clean up your mess. Clean, you know, take Lightroom and clean up your mess. We had a few people that had taken our other course and they asked for something more in line of better or further explanation of the catalog and the file system, which we couldn't do in depth in the original, which is why this came about. You asked for it, we delivered it. And we kept with the same format that everybody seems to love so much of the short little videos and then, you know, that way you can have a chance to, to kind of go along with Joe as he teaches you like a two, three minute video, right? Do you realize how hard it is for me to only talk for two or three minutes at a time? <laughs> anyway, you can watch it and then rewind if you need to watch again. So there's a pre-order class price. I'm not going to mention it, but it's really, really, really cheap because this podcast is going to be online for a long time. But go to onlinephotoworkshops.com slash courses and you'll see it there. You'll see the introductory price, you'll get a better ex explanation of what the class is all about, and then it will be available on October 1st. And while you're there, the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography, which is our signature course, which is going to teach you about shooting in manual, composition, lighting, flash, all kinds of stuff, metering, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. That starts October 5th, so check that out as well. Okay, so now you guys already know Joe. He's the producer of this show. He's the technical side of Understand Photography, the lead instructor. He's also the president of the Florida Camera Club Council, Mr. Fancy Pants. <laughs> so um, we, are, we, are, we did kind of throw together a, a, a show today because our guest is, he just got home last night and he has no power. He's got little kids. He's looking for a place to live. So. 
hopefully we're going to get him on soon again. But for now, we're going to talk about metering modes. Or metering modes. No, nope, no. Nope. Take a guess, Peggy. Camera what are we modes. going to talk about? Camera modes. I'm sorry. I knew <laughs> Look that. Look at the shirt. <laughs> I said metering. It got stuck in my mind. So we're going to talk about the different camera modes, why, when and why to use each one of them. It's a nice shirt you got there. Yeah, I like that. I have all the different exposure modes on there and a couple extra that are on my sevens. So your sevens being your seven D cameras. Canon seven D. They have these. That's actually the the dial from a seven D Mark One. Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah, ah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, that's so, why I couldn't resist the shirt. <laughs> all right, so go through them. Let's, okay, let's talk well, about your shirt. <laughs> okay, let's talk about my shirt. Uh, we, we have uh, the fully automatic modes, and then we have program TV. Uh, what's TV? Everybody else has an S there for shutter. Canon says TV. For time value. For time value, right. They're allowed to do that. They had the first automatic, the SLR that had an automatic shutter, so they can do what they want. Uh, yeah, you want. The aperture value, manual. Manual. <laughs> bulb. And then these are custom settings. With the C1, some cameras will have one, and sometimes they'll have two or three, the better cameras. And they allow you to set up a whole set of parameters, everything you want, your exposure, your white balance, uh, how many shots you're taking at once, everything you want, and then you put it all on that. And then when you want all those things, you just turn to C1 and okay. you got that. Real handy if you do different types of photography consistently. Okay, all right. I always have one set up for HDR. So now, let's go through these, okay? So why, why are there so many choices? I would think they'd just be automatic and manual. Well, yeah, you would, you would think that, but the problem is manual, obviously, you set everything. So mm -hmm. that is what it is. But with the automatic mode, if you set it up so the camera does everything, well, maybe sometimes it does something that you don't want to do. Maybe that engineer sitting in his office in Tokyo or, or somewhere in Berlin or wherever it is, maybe what, his deci what he decides is important in the exposure the depth of field or the shutter speed, this freeze motion, isn't what you want. So you wind up with the wrong automatic setting. So they give you intermediate ones. They give you one where you can choose the shutter and let the camera take care of the rest. And they give you one where you can choose the aperture and let the camera let take care of the rest. Let me ask you this though. If you're in full automatic, and I know the answer, but I want you to answer it. Um, those are M A. TVP, those are exposure modes, right? Yes. But automatic is way more than an exposure mode. Am I right? The P is, well, yeah, when you're in fully automatic, it's deciding everything. Okay, it's deciding so fully the, automatic is the green box. And that's, gonna, and that's going to decide your exposure, which means your ISO aperture and shutter speed is going to come with, up with the right combination to get the right amount of light into your camera. Cross fingers. Right. So it's going to decide on that. It's going to decide on your white balance. Right. So it's going to decide on your color automatically. Mm -hmm. Now even in an automatic mode you can choose a picture mode, am I right? Yes. And yeah. what is that? The picture style modes, called different names, the Nikon and Canon and Panasonic, uh, they're like the uh, the treatments that you get in your phone, you know, where it allows you to filters. get filters in your phone, basically the mm -hmm. same thing. Do you want something uh, with a sepia tone? Or the, the standard ones usually have a landscape, they have a portrait, they have a night and things like that. When you put it in the landscape, it punches up the blues and the greens. If you put it in portrait, it makes the skin tones look more pleasing. Okay, it softens them, it desaturates them somewhat. Now, now, on a DSLR, if you're in fully automatic, how do you get to those picture modes? Are they in the menu? Some are in the menu and some are each with a button on the back or with a touch screen. Because I know the yeah. compact cameras, they have the choices well, right on the dial. Many, many, uh, many of the uh, DSLRs, you'll have another button in here which would be like picture mode or something and then you could go through from that. Okay. Or something, uh, or sometimes you have to go in the menu and set it that way. So if you're going to shoot fully, let's just talk about fully automatic for okay. a while. Okay, so green box. Green box. As opposed to P for program. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and most of the time it says automatic or auto yeah, right on yeah, it. So, yeah. um, oh gosh, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, when you're in green box, you're along for the ride. 
the camera's doing the deciding everything. You're just pressing the button. But you can customize your, what you keep calling it, green box, I call it auto. But you can customize that with the different picture styles. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. But you can't alter the exposure or the, the basic white balance. Uh, or you're, you're, it's all programmed in there. And also, you can only shoot in JPEG, correct? Uh, with some of the newer ones now, you can shoot in RAW as well. Really? There's a couple that are doing RAW now, yeah. Now, what's the difference between RAW and JPEG, and why is one better than the other? Okay, uh, the information that's recorded on the sensor, that all that electronic information that's dumped to the memory card, if it's just dumped to the memory card, that's a RAW file. It's just all the, it's just a readout of everything that was on the sensor. Okay. And that needs to be processed later with your software. A JPEG, after that readout is done off the sensor, the camera's computer then converts that into an image, mm -hmm. called it a, in a JPEG file format. But it does more than just convert it, it also compresses it to save space. Mm. And the way it compresses it, it throws out information. Mm. It'll look, and let's say you have a uh, hundred colors, or, or let's say you have a hundred graduations from bright to dark. So I'll say, I don't need 100, I can get away with 10. Because your eye can't really because see Because your it. eye really won't see it. And on a small size, your eye might not see it. But if you blow it up big enough, then you're going to start to see it's not going to be smooth okay. if it's blown up enough. Or if you start to process the image and do a lot of heavy processing on the image with the saturation, this and that, it brings that out where you can see the blockiness caused by that. Okay. okay, so, so that's so, the difference between raw and JPEG. Yeah, the, the big thing is too, since it's thrown away that other information, if you've gotten the color or white balance wrong, you don't have the other color there anymore to bring it back. Yeah, Where with a raw, it's got everything in the original one and you can do more with it. What's the benefit of shooting a JPEG? The size, well with a JPEG, you can take the image right off the camera, post it to Facebook or anything like that, just right off the card, you don't need any software to process it. You could take it to the lab. You could take it to the lab and do anything. With a raw file, it has to be processed with software. Either the software that came with your camera, uh -huh. say DPP in the case of a Canon camera. And that stands for? Digital Photo Professional. Okay. Okay. And um, that's, the, that's the software that comes with the Canon camera. That cameras. comes free with a Canon camera. It's really good software. By yes, the way. it is excellent software. Uh, Nikon has one too. Uh, most of them have some kind of raw processor with them. Some are very limited in what scope and some are uh, very flexible, full program like, like Canon's. Or you buy a third party program, you know, uh, uh, Adobe Photoshop Elements, ACDC, uh, Lightroom, Photoshop of course, all these aftermarket programs. But the thing is you have to open it up in that program and then resave it to create a JPEG. So you know what I teach when I'm teaching beginners? They're like, well, should I shoot in RAW or JPEG? And in my opinion is, it depends on your level of computer pro proficiency. Because a lot of our students are older mm -hmm. and they don't know a lot about the computer. I tell them, start shooting in JPEG, learn your camera first, then as you learn your camera, then go to the next step and start learning the software. because. You have to learn the software yeah. to process raw files. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if you're 19 years old and you grew up on a computer, shoot in raw. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could always shoot raw plus JPEG. That's a good point. And then you have the JPEG for immediate, and then later on, if you've taken a really good picture back when you were a beginner, uh, and you want to do something further with that, you have the raw file there to, to process. Good you know, So you can do that. And but then, of course, it's space. You're taking up space on the card. But okay. space these days is cheap. So um, that's if you're looking in your menus, that's in your quality settings. It's yes. always called quality, I think, on every camera, right? Uh, like Nikon and Canon both call it quality, I'm pretty sure. I don't Nikon know about has Sony's. two different settings. They have a quality setting and I think a size setting. They break it up into two parts, oh. you know, which is strange, but they. But you usually you should have something in there. And then usually, now you, nowadays you see also a compressed raw file. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just to make things more confusing. Yeah. But in automatic, do you even get a choice of what size JPEG? I don't think so. 
I know some of, yeah, I think you do. Oh, you I do? Think, yeah, I think and that you, would be in the menu probably yeah, as well. Yeah, and if you're shooting JPEG, I would say always shoot in the best quality JPEG. Maximum size, best quality. I mean, that's what you bought the camera for. You, you've got a good camera. It, it's like you buy a Ferrari and you say, okay, I'm never going to take it out of first gear. You know, you want all the quality you can get, so. Shoot Although, there. I'm going to tell you a story about something I did bad. <laughs> I'm so ashamed I'm going to tell the world. You drove a Ferrari in first gear? <laughs> no, I, um, it was, honest to God, it was my first wedding that I did digitally. Mm -hmm. And I was nervous because I had never, you know, I'd been right. practicing, but, you know, I never really did a real wedding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I put... You know, back then the compact flash cards were really expensive. Yeah. So a 256 megabyte card was $150. Yeah, crazy. So I didn't have too many of them, yeah. right? So I was practicing because I, you know, practice, practice, practice because I was so nervous. But I was going through the compact flash cards too fast, so I put it in small JPEG. Oh, wow. And I shot the entire wedding oh. until about the late at night. And then I realized, I freaked out. I had already done the wedding. I had done the portraits. Oh, my God. But this is back with my Canon 10D 6.3 megapixels. And she got an album. And back then, we print, you know, we, had, we got the 8x10 and 5x7 mm -hmm. prints yeah. and put them in the matted albums. Mm -hmm. And they were beautiful. So, yeah, there was probably two megabyte files. But for an 8x10, it's, you can get away with it. I was yeah. so scared. <laughs> I got, another, should, uh, I got should, another story, too. Uh, I make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Don't we all? So another time, I was working a wedding, and I ran out. I was like on my last card, and it said I had like 10 shots left, and I still was scheduled for another hour. Mm. And you know, late at night, you don't take as many pictures because right. it's just dancing. Yeah. You already got a million shots. But I was like, oh my god, what am I going to do? So I put it in small JPEGs, and then I had mm. 100 shots or yeah. something left. Yeah. And you know they didn't they didn't get an eight by ten of anything of the dancing. Yeah. Well, the people don't. So, so they just have it. oh my god! But when I first started with digital photography, I was the first professional photographer in this area to go digital. It was about two thousand one, and everybody was so snobby. Oh, you only shoot raw if you don't know what you're doing. You know, if you're shooting spot on exposures, you should be shooting in JPEG. So I did, because I mean, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of fumbling around trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to learn digital photography because we didn't have the internet like we do. Right. There were no classes or anything. Mm -hmm. I used to drive up to Sarasota to the Dimash group because they talked about digital photography. So it was, it was a big learning curve back then. It seems so simple now, yeah. but back then it was a big thing. Anyway, those are my JPEG stories. <laughs> you know, one thing they said there, okay, if you really know what you're doing, you can shoot JPEG. Well, well, yeah, if you, you know, because if the exposure is perfect and you had enough dynamic range in the scene and the, the camera got the white balance right, well, fine. You know, all you're probably ever going to need is the JPEG. But that's not always true. I have another. It's almost never true. <laughs> I have another story. Oh, so when I first, uh, you know, I, I took as many classes I, as yeah. I could. I used to budget $7,000 a year for training because we had to go somewhere for training. Mm -hmm. We didn't have all this internet stuff. Yeah. So I signed up for a workshop with Bambi Cantrell, who's a very famous wedding photographer, amazing, amazing, and very good teacher. So I uh, took the workshop, learned a lot, and then at the end of the workshop, she said, you know, would you like to come back as my assistant? You can, you, s you have to pay for your hotel and food and everything, but you can come to the class part for free, but you have to help me. So I said, okay. So I go, I went back to Georgia where she had the workshop and uh, she flew in from doing a wedding. And you know, she was, at the time she was 10 grand. I mean, this is 2002 maybe. Mm. And uh, very expensive California, you know, Northern California photographer. But she's from Georgia, that's why she had the workshops there. So she flew in, and I can't remember the software I used back then, but she put, she hadn't done anything with her pictures. So she put them up to show us how she processed. She put them all up there, and it looked like, you know, kind of like mm -hmm. the thumbnails in Lightroom look now. And I am gonna say one out of every five pictures look good, and the rest of them look like crap. And I went, Oh my God, that made me feel so good because I thought people like her never made a mistake. 
I thought I was the only one who was taking all these crappy pictures in between the good ones, you know? I had no idea that everybody takes a bunch of crappy pictures. Absolutely. So, anyway, I went off on a tangent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody I'm gets... in hurricane mode. I had a beer at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> nobody gets anywhere near 100%. Now these guys that shoot with the, the big uh, field view cameras, you know, 8x10 and 5x7, oh. most of their shots are spot on, but they, but it took them a long time experimenting to get that way. And they're not doing weddings. They're not doing weddings, they're doing a static scene, that's a little right. different thing. But no, when you're shooting action photography, you know. Uh, yeah. I think she, she doesn't even know how she, she yeah. helped my self-esteem yeah. yeah. because of yeah. that. That's the reality. I see all the, I see a, any good pro, and all his pictures look perfect. That's because a good pro knows how to cull his images before he exactly. shows them to anybody. Throw them away. <laughs> In fact, that is one of my advices when I, you know, because I teach a class on event photography. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, event photography was a lifesaver. At first I thought, I would, oh, I didn't want to do it. It didn't seem that challenging. But then I got in with the high society people through event photography. And the biggest thing they all say to me is, you always take a good picture. I said, no, I always throw away the bad pictures is what it is. Another thing you can do with that if you're doing events or something like that where you're delivering the stuff is after you've done your coloring, rename them oh, so sequentially, they don't sequentially so they won't have any missing numbers. So they don't know that you threw them away. <laughs> well, it keeps them from going back and asking for a photo that you know, where they had their eyes closed or something, you know, just Believe this me, is I, anything, you know. I have people swear, I know you took this picture, yeah. and I, I can tell you if it's sequentially that I didn't, but whatever. Yeah. Well, if the right, sequence so, is right in there, they, you know. Yeah, then they don't. Yeah. So what's the difference between automatic, the green box, and P, program mode? In program mode, the program inside the camera is the same as far as how it decides the auto exposure, but you can override it. You can quickly roll your dial on the back and bias it uh, darker or lighter, uh, faster shutter speed or wider aperture or whatever. You can bias it quickly while you're while you're shooting. Okay. Okay. So that's the basic thing. Plus, you can set whatever uh, white balance you want. Uh, uh, you can not have the ISO automatically determined. You can set instead of being an auto ISO, you can set that yourself and just have it worry about the shutter and aperture. Okay. So you have more flexibility. What else? That's the principal differences. Okay. I mean, everything else is pretty much well, like the green box. Well, you can shoot into it in raw. Well, you yeah, said you some of the yeah, automatic. It used to be the only way you get the raw is if you were in P. You couldn't do it in a green box, but I'm noticing the latest versions of the Rebels and the, uh, the, the Nikon 5300 series are letting you shoot raw in, in program mode. Now, one of the things that I notice is that m it seems like most, to me, most of the photography instructors teach people to shoot in aperture priority, which I, I, I personally don't agree with, but why, why do you think that is? And what, it, what is, let's start with what is aperture priority? Okay. Uh, now, it's A on the a, Sony and Nikon, yeah. and it's A, B, B yeah. on a Canon. In aperture priority, you're choosing the aperture. Mm -hmm. The aperture is the iris in the lens that opens and closes to allow more or less light in. It also determines the depth of field. In other words, how much is in focus around the point of focus. So if you want a blurry background, you use a wide open aperture, which is a little number. We deliberately do that to confuse you. You know, big number, small hole, small number, big hole. I mean, that's just to, we could have done it the other way and made it much simpler, but then, you know, so we did, so it's done that way just to confuse you as a beginner. You know, it's it's just simple geometry. Did I tell you that story? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, teaching my beginner class, and your it was your friend. You recommended Charles Charles Lamb, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm I have a full class, fifteen people or something, and I have the picture of the apertures, and I said you just have to memorize the numbers because it's very confusing because f two is bigger than f sixteen. Yeah. And he looks up there and he, and he says, well, that's just simple geometry. And everybody in the class laughed at him. <laughs> I felt bad for him because it wasn't simple to anyone else but him who had some smarty pants brain. <laughs> well, if, if you knew what it stood for, when you see it written right, you have the F number, and then you have the slash, and then you have the other number. It's a fraction. 
Right. It's F over that, so it's a fraction. So one quarter is bigger than one eighth. That's why the number is changing. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom number. I forget what you call that. It's been a long time since I had math, but it's the bottom number in the fraction. That's why it's doing that. That yeah. doesn't make any sense to either. <laughs> I didn't even know yeah, until you said that in my class. I have no is. idea yeah. why they had those weird numbers. Yeah, but that's what it is. But anyway, getting back to it, uh, as the aperture gets smaller, bigger number, you have a greater depth of field. So everything's going to be in sharp, near to far. So F8, F11, F16, right. everything's going to be pretty sharp. Yes. The whole picture. Whole front so you're to You're not back. going to have a blurry background. Right. But F2.8. Then you're getting a blurry background or, and blurry foreground because remember the depth of field is around the point of focus. Okay. Not from the camera out, it's around the point of focus. Okay. So if you get down to F2, you might have a blurry foreground, not a blurry background. Uh, uh -huh. I think you have a a shot in one of your classes where you have the baskets hanging and go out mm -hmm. of focus both ways. But yeah, so you're controlling the aperture. And that's an aperture priority. An you aperture control. priority. You're, you're so selecting. how do you do that? So you turn your dial to A or right. A B and then what do you do? You turn one of the dials? Generally generally you're turning whatever the primary control dial is on your camera. So you now turn if, that it, if it's a rebel or a, a Nikon thirty three hundred or another beginner camera, there's usually only one control dial. Oh yeah, and you have to hold the button down and turn the dial. Yeah. Okay, so you turn the dial and what the dial is doing is it's changing the aperture. Exactly. So let's say I change my aperture to f4.0. Then what happens when I take a picture? The camera automatically closes down to whatever your predetermined aperture. Well, it just the, the, stays at that aperture, right? It, it, well, yeah, it, it, it's always open until the point of, right. and then it closes down, but it's going to just But it chooses be, your shutter. It chooses your shutter, maybe your ISO, depending on whether you decided on that or not. Now, what do you mean by that? In other words, remember, we could, have, we could set the ISO manually, mm -hmm. or we could have auto ISO. Okay. Now, if you have it on automatic, it's going to decide the ISO it needs. It's going to look at the shutter speed and make sure the shutter speed is fast enough to hand hold without blurring the image. And how will it know that? The program inside. It's been programmed by the uh, thing. Usually they use the old rule of uh, whatever the focal length is, that was, that's what the shutter speed has to be. So All in right, other so words, if you're, shooting two, uh, uh, if you're shooting a 200 millimeter lens, the mm -hmm. shutter speed minimum would be 1 200th. And if it gets down to 1 200th, then it'll start to kick up the ISO to hold it there until it runs out of way to kick up the ISO, and then it'll start to drop the shutter speed back down. And somewhere along the line, it'll give you one of these handhold warnings and a shake warning in the viewfinder. Now, after priority, I was extremely opposed to it until they came out with the uh, automatic ISO. Because remember, they haven't had yeah. that out very many yeah, years. Yeah, right. And all of, I don't know why, but all these internet teachers were teaching everybody to shoot an aperture priority and my problem with that is they weren't really understanding what they were doing because it is an automatic mode. Mm -hmm. They understood the concept of the depth of field, that the wide aperture would give them the shallow depth of field, but they didn't understand the relationship with the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO, which I think is imperative. Absolutely. You have to understand those three things. So. They were all, all of my students would come to class and they would have all, their pictures would all be blurry because the problem is, and you know the technical stuff better than I, but when they looked at the back of the camera, the picture looked fine mm -hmm. because the exposure was correct. Yeah. And by exposure, I mean lighting. Mm -hmm. So that was correct. But then when they got home and put it on the computer, everything was blurry because... They the shutter speed just kept getting slower and slower. Yeah, they couldn't see it in that little tiny image. And but you when can't they blew tell, up, because can why see. can't you tell? Because it's the, just too small to, to see that amount of blur. Now, if you took the image on the back of the camera and used your zoom in on it, you would see the blurriness. Well, but plus I mean, there's only 72 pixels per inch, too, so you yeah, there, that issue, Yeah, too. They're, they're all different ones, but the resolution on the screen on the back is nowhere near what you're, so you you're actually looking know. at now. But I, I know a lot of people with aperture priorities still have that problem with getting blurry shots because even if, you know, okay, let's say you're at 200th of a second and your lens is at 200, that's the slowest, right, that you should have your yeah. shutter speed. So if you jerked your camera or something, you're still going to get blurry picture. Absolutely. And usually when you're a beginner, you don't have the hand-holding technique yet either. 
yet, which is something that both you and I are very, very feel strongly about holding your camera correctly. Mm -hmm. Elbows in, left hand underneath, and that you're like your own little tripod, right? Yeah. That's going to hold your camera steady or you're going to get sharper images. I used to do target shooting back when I was in college, and that's where you learn ah. breathing technique and, and holding correctly, and you're, it's the same thing with a camera, you're, you're aiming it, and of course when you're aiming at a target and you shoot and you're this far off the bullseye, it's the same thing, and you see it very clearly then, the importance of holding right, breath, proper breath control. By breath control, I don't mean holding your breath. I mean, learning how to breathe it out properly. Oh. Never hold your breath when you, if you hold your breath, you feel your whole body tense up. Oh, yeah. And that's transmitted to it. You, you're exhaling as you're taking the shot, whether it's at a target or capturing an image. All right, what else about aperture priority? Well, I think so many reasons people teach it because they're lazy. I agree with that. I think not the people learning it, the instructors, because they don't have to delve into the shutter and the ISO and everything else, but you wind up with people that are limited in their knowledge. And okay, they'll get a picture with a blurry background. A lot of people, they want, I want to learn, I want to learn how to take a picture where the background's blurry. Yeah. You know, but there's more to photography than that. And they don't learn about the uh, keeping an eye on the shutter speed and, and what have you. And they don't know what to do at all. Uh, that's why I, I very much agree with your teaching technique, and that's one of the things I really liked uh, when I joined you, is, is the way you taught uh, your basic course. You emphasize, it's probably the only one in the area that does, learning in manual first, because that way you learn what the aperture does. You learn what the shutter is. You learn what the ISO is. And having this knowledge, you can combine them together. And it also, now you know when shutters, shutter priority is appropriate, when aperture priority is appropriate, when programs appropriate, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we go out boating a lot. Well, I have my little Alex 100, and half the time I'm out there, it's on IA, which is Panasonic's Intelligent Auto, which is close to a green box mode, and it works great. I mean, a bouncy boat, it's working good, and mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it, you know. Plus, those little cameras are they're harder. They're difficult to, Like, yeah. I have a Lumix, and yeah. it's, I can shoot a manual, but it's really hard. Yeah. I'm happy with mine, but, but it's, you know, it, it's easier to shoot that in an automatic mm -hmm. mode. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. So, all right, so aperture priority. What about shutter priority? Shutter priority, you're picking the shutter speed, and shutter speed controls motion blur. Okay. From freezing the shot to getting a very blurry shot. And of course, there's artistic choices here. Uh, you may be doing something in sports, a bird in flight, and you want to freeze the motion of the bird, wings razor sharp and everything else, so you want a very high shutter speed. Uh, at the same time, maybe you're at a, a, a carnival at night, and you have all these rides, and you want to get the blur of the Ferris wheel just turning it into circles of light or something like that, so you use a very slow shutter speed. I but why would you use shutter priority for that as opposed to, to me that would be way easier to do in manual. Well, yeah, I'm just giving you advantages of when you would use shutter priority versus aperture or program. Okay. Not manual, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you would also, I'll use, if I'm using an automatic mode, generally I use shutter. Okay. Because I, most of my photography is things in motion. If I'm not doing landscapes, I'm doing birds, or I'm doing rodeos, or some kind of sporting event. And it's important that I freeze the motion. The depth of field is secondary. If it's blurred, it doesn't matter whether I had two inches of depth of field or 90 million miles, it's still junk. It's junk, yeah. So I'm picking the, what I need for a shutter speed and then the camera might be determined that. When would I use that opposed to manual? Uh, I'm shooting baseball game here, here at the park here, okay? I'm shooting the Miracle. And second base is in sunlight, and third base is in full shade. Ooh. And they're running back and forth, and I might need a play here or a play there. And even though I'm comfortable doing it, sometimes those changes are too difficult. So I'll set up for one, and I'll hope the camera changes the aperture enough so I have a good shot either way. So you, when you shoot in shutter priority, you shoot an automatic ISO as well? No, I'm picking the I'm oh, fixed ISO. Okay. 
So it just changes the aperture. Just, just changing the aperture. You know, the, I only used shutter priority one time in my life, and I was so grateful for it. <laughs> it was a long time ago, too. We were, it was a fashion show put on by the private mm -hmm. high school right. at the Naples Beach Hotel in, the, in their big, you know, conference center. And they had some famous designer who I, of course, I had no idea who he was, young though, designer. So all the teenagers were the models. And, you know, I'm not a fashion photographer, so not in Naples, Florida. <laughs> anyway, um, they had the catwalk, like went straight down and I was at the end of the catwalk with the other photographers because there was the only, that was the only place to be mm -hmm. because all the people were around the right. sides, right? Well, they didn't have a spotlight on the models. They had the spotlights crossing over the runway. So the model, it was like really loud, fast music. They were walking real fast. So the model walked into the spotlight, out of the spotlight, into the spotlight, yeah. out of the spotlight. I'm in manual going, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. And so I switched it to shutter priority because they were yeah. walking fast right. and it was really dark in there yeah. except for when they were in the spotlight. So mm -hmm. I was in auto automatic yeah. ISO. I can see doing that too, yeah. So that was you probably like, run out of aperture there too. But there was no way I could change my yeah. set. I am really fast in, as you are yeah. in changing my settings because mm -hmm. I always shoot in manual yeah. mode. But I'm not that fast. They but were the, going fast and in and out of that bright light. Oh. So basically that's what I use in automatic mode. When the lighting conditions are changing so fast that it's more consistent for me to let the camera make that change. So would bird photography be a good example? And sports, I guess? Well, in, in some sports, I'll, like I say, like with the baseball game, I'm doing that. Uh, bird photography, mostly I'm always in manual. I'm in manual 90% of the time, except on the boat and intelligent yeah, auto. Right. But, but uh, because most of the time, the lighting conditions are not going to change. Okay, I, I go to a sporting event, you know, what, whatever, and it's in full sunlight or it's a cloudy day and it's in full shade. I meter, dial in my exposure, whatever ISO, aperture, and shutter speed that I need that's appropriate for what I'm doing, and then I forget about it for the rest of the day. I don't give exposure a thought other than I'm aware of the lighting conditions changing, you know, it getting darker in the afternoon or brighter after sunrise, but I'm not metering every shot. I wrote an article for the Understand Photography blog, and if you want to find anything, any article, what you do is you do understandphotography.com in the address bar and then a space and whatever your search term is. So if you do that, understandphotography.com space lacrosse. I wrote an article about when I went to photograph my nephew playing lacrosse at night. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not a sports photographer, so it, I was out of my comfort zone and I had my you know, 70 to 300 lens. And I, I wrote like all of the things I went through. And I tried to shoot in shutter priority and I found it way easier to shoot in manual. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, yeah. the lighting didn't change. No. And once you have your exposure dialed in, you don't worry about it anymore. Once you can worry it, about getting a shot. It took me a while to get it. Yeah. But once I got it, I didn't change it. Well, like we said. dial it in with white birds, you know, trying to get it so you don't blow out the back. But but after a while, you know that too. As you know, I do a, a St. Augustine trip every year where we go up in the spring, always around the same time, usually the last week in April. But you're not doing it this year. I'm not doing it this anyway, year. Go ahead. <laughs> last week in April, first week in May, and we go up and we shoot the birds nesting in the rookery. And before we go in, we, we have to wait outside till it opens and then go in. So I have the group with me and we're standing there. And I tell them all what to set their exposure to. 12000 F8 ISO 400. And they can go in, and for the first hour, they don't have to touch a thing. They will perfectly expose every white bird and in the place. how do you know that you just memorized it? It's just from so long doing it. If they're in the sunlight, that's what it is up there. Wow. 2000 F8 ISO 400, you know, which is just a modification of the Sunny 16 roll, really. Yeah. When I was taking. I mean, I took every photography class there was locally yeah. because, you know, it's a lot more expensive to go somewhere else. And there was a guy who taught in adult education, and he, he was a great, nice guy. Um, maybe not the greatest teacher, but one of the things he said just stuck in my mind forever. He, 
was telling us we were all going to go, our homework was to go to the Naples Depot and take creative shots, which I didn't like that homework because I need, I need more specifics. I'm that mm -hmm. kind of person when you say that, I, I don't know what that means and I'm, maybe I'm not creative and I don't know what anybody else is doing. I feel all insecure. I didn't like it. But what he said, of course, this is film. He said F8 at 100 and I don't know what he said now. I can't take 125. One 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 twenty fifth of a second, I think, is what he said. And I was like, "Wow, how does he know that?" And he said, "I just after a while, you just memorize." And that to me was such a big thing. That was the best thing he taught me in that class because I did not understand what was going on, but I could memorize settings. Yeah. So I knew if it was sunny, what to do. I knew when I was doing sunset portraits, I knew what settings. I just didn't understand why. That's why. When I finally did understand why, it was like, this is simple. Why couldn't anybody teach yeah. me? I took classes for years before I understood it. And I'm talking $7,000 a year yeah. worth of yeah. training, and nobody's teaching me how to shoot in the manual mm -hmm. mode. Yeah. And I could teach it in, well, we teach it in two hours, but I could teach it in one hour. Yeah. And once you learn it and you understand, but when you learn manual, then you know what your aperture is doing. And you know what that controls. You know what your shutter's control. You know what that control. You know what the effects of raising your ISO are going to be. And you know all these things, so you can make an intelligent choice. If and you're so, going to put it in aperture, well, how do you know what aperture to choose unless you know the whole exposure triangle? You know, do I open it up? Do I close it down? Same thing with the shutter. So if you learn manual, you don't have to use it all the time, but you know when to make intelligent so, choices. Yeah. And what so they let's should let's just keep talking about manual for a little bit. Okay. So. The whole concept is to understand what you're doing. Exactly. And what do you need to learn to understand what you're doing? You need to know where the meter is. Right. And that you need to know that the meter needs to be on zero for a good exposure. Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. Yeah. Then you need to know what your aperture does, your shutter speed does, and your ISO. Right. And that's all you need. If you learn that, you're gonna you're gonna start like everything else will make sense yeah, to you. It'll Am all I make right? Sense. It'll all make sense, and it's nowhere nowhere near as confusing. I, I'll tell you what. Anybody that you've taught manual or I've taught manual, after they've got it, they all say, "This is really easier." Because you're gonna find if you're using an automatic mode, a lot of times, unless you're taking just snap card, uh, postcard kind of shots that the exposure isn't all, the metering fails you. The picture times are too light or too dark. So then you have to second guess the camera and you change your, you have an exposure value change on the camera so you can make the next picture brighter or darker. So you're constantly turning that wheel back and forth, looking at it's too dark, they'll change it's too light. And you don't realize every time you take another picture the meter changed too, so you're chasing it. Where if you put it on manual, and maybe it takes you two shots to get the right exposure. But once you've done those two shots, like I say, when I'm in an event, I'm done for the day. I'm just shooting. I'm, you know, and I can I can worry about my composition. I can worry about getting the right shot. I can follow it. I'm not constantly worrying about what I have to do. You're not worrying about it, but you're paying attention. Yeah. That's what I like about oh, manual too. Yeah. Because so many people take all these bad pictures because they're just they're so like used to shooting in an automatic mode that they're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm chipping too. You know, so you, you get the same ones that used to tell you, well, I want to shoot raw. They say, well, I never look at the thing in the back. Why would you not? That's crazy. That's yeah, crazy. Of course. You should you know, look at the back I of mean, the camera. Do you really, I mean, back in the film days, if you're shooting large format, you had a Polaroid back you would put on it mm -hmm. so you could get an instant shot to make sure it was going to be okay before you took the money shot with the good film. Yeah. Just to check. Yeah. You know, you wanted that check. Yeah. I think photographers have, have become a lot nicer, though. Do you? Maybe because there's so many people who are photographers now. When I was learning photography, everybody was such a snob. <laughs> it seemed like everybody was so self righteous and you should do this, and you shouldn't do that, and oh, if you do this, and I don't well, know. There's, there's another reason for that. You were a woman in a man's profession. Oh, I never thought of that. I mean, you really were. Yeah. Now it's a woman's profession. You're right, it flipped. You know, I've been in two, yeah. two professions that flipped while yeah. I was in them. Yeah. I was a bartender. Yeah. Yeah. And when I first started bartending, very few women were. And that flipped. Yeah. And now, same yeah. thing with yeah. the, in the wedding business. Oh, I am such a trendsetter, yeah. aren't I? In the, in the wedding business, she just 
shoved all us guys out, so no wonder they didn't want to talk to you. They knew you were pushing them out. But I find today, uh, whether they're professional or amateur, everyone is so willing to help each other. Yeah. You know, if, if you have a couple fishermen and they have a fishing spot, they'll go to their grave without telling you what it is. They won't tell their wives or their own kids. You get a photographer. You've got to see this spot. Oh, man, you've got to come here. You can get the greatest pictures. We share. Yeah. You know, we're not afraid to most, show somebody else. Most. Well, I, I, think, <laughs> I think a larger number than in a lot of other I, professions and hobbies. I, I agree. Yeah. I know. I, I'm shocked at how many people are like, oh, you're so so willing to share everything. And I'm thinking, well, why wouldn't I? Yeah. I think they think because I am still a working photographer that, like, I'm worried about them taking my jobs. Well... You know what? They already did. They took a lot of my jobs. I was a big children's photographer. That business is pretty much gone. But I'm not worrying about them taking my jobs now because as long as you're giving excellent service and doing giving a good product, you're going to keep your customers, you know? Absolutely. But let's continue to talk about manual a little bit. So the three, comp okay, so we learned that we need the meter on zero, and then we have those three components of the exposure triangle. That's what we call that, right? right. ISO, mm -hmm. shutter yeah. speed, aperture. Yeah. Unless you're one of the nerds on some of the uh, forums, and then they have a new thing. ISO is not part of the exposure. That's the latest. Well, and they get into this. I, We're not even going to talk about it. But, well, I, but in case what? they're listening, I know what you're talking about. I understand your point. But guess what? The rest of us still call it the exposure triangle. Deal with it. Uh, well, and it's true because when I teach, I teach something that's not a complete truth. Yeah. Because what I say about these three things, the ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, I say that each one of them lets light come into the camera or yeah. stops light from right. coming into yeah. the camera. So you have to find the right, you know, yeah. okay, so if you want the meter on zero, that's the goal. So if this one's open for a long time, letting a lot of light in, you got to shut down one of the other ones. And with ISO, that's not exactly no, true. Yeah. You're changing the sensitivity, but yeah. But it's but, still. But it's it's we've always considered ISO to be part of the exposure. Right. And most of us still. And don't. it works the same works way yeah, as it's like a, when you have a high ISO, it's like letting more light in. Yeah, and we've we've done the ISO in stops equivalent to a change in aperture or change in shutter speed so that you can use it as part of the triangle and so, a stop of light is a stop of light or whatever. So you know. let's just start with the aperture. The aperture is a hole, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And you could have a big hole mm -hmm. or a little hole. Yes. And that controls your depth of field as you said. Okay. So that's the first thing. If you have a big hole, there's a lot of light coming in. Right. It's a big pipe. So if you have a big hole, you probably are going to want a faster shutter speed, right? So the shutter speed is like a curtain right. that opens, and if it's open for a long time, Less there's a lot, a lot of light, yeah. and if it's open for a quick time, right. only a little light. So if you have a fast shutter speed, you're probably going to want a bigger aperture or mm -hmm. a higher yeah. ISO. So it just works like sure. a triangle, like yeah. they say. Exactly. It's really pretty simple. Yeah. Now, it, once you get the balance, and they're all measured in stops, which is an arbitrary measurement of the amount of light coming in. So if I change one thing by a stop positively to let more light in, and I change another variable, one of the other two things, by a stop the other direction, I still have the same amount of light coming in. So I and have how the same do you know? You know by the meter. You know by the meter. So if you look at your meter and it's one stop, you know, on the plus one side, then you know what? That you have to change something by a... You either have to have a faster shutter speed or a smaller to the, I have to reduce the light by a stop somehow. Right. somehow. Either make the sensor less sensitive by reducing the ISO or changing the shutter speed, making it faster to reduce the amount of time that the light is pouring in on the sensor. So our whole point is you really, really should learn to shoot a manual first. And, and you know what, you could, you know, if you're a book person, you can pick it up probably. Yeah. Um, of course, we love, our, you know, we hope you take our four weeks to proficiency in photography class. That's, you know, we really baby step you through it. And then we give you homework. You know, here's a bunch of different things to do with aperture. Here's different things to do with shutter speed. Here's things to do, do with ISO. But there's nothing wrong with aperture priority. Absolutely not. 
and I know from what I see is it's really good for like children's photographer who they want to keep a really wide open aperture so that they have a blurry background mm -hmm. but they're chasing a kid around so you know they might not want to be changing their shutter speed because yeah. he might be running into the shade and running into the light and so that would be a good example of when to use aperture priority mm -hmm. a lot of bird photographers recommend it and i don't understand that i would think that they would recommend shutter priority. well they they do it but they always go with the revision but keep an eye on your shutter speed okay but they're they don't want they especially with the longer lens you're very limited on depth of field and your depth of field can change drastically with just a third of a stop change so they'd rather dial in the depth of field that they know they need to get the whole bird in focus the head or the wings or whatever but they're keeping a careful eye on what that shutter speed is doing like they're checking it they, they may as well be on manual yeah. And you'll find a lot of them are. I mean, you see that on our show, talking to different wildlife photographers. Some will shoot shutter priority, some will shoot aperture, but you'll find most of them are shooting on manual. Yeah, yeah. And then shutter priority would be sports. Yeah, what, any, sports, any, especially sports with bad light or with lighting is going to change, change yeah, right? Change, changeable lighting. That's where I use it for the most. I mean, so the, action with changeable lighting. Yeah, and, and like there's nothing wrong with automatic modes. The reason I originally got into the Canon system was because they were the first ones out that had a program with the whole deal that you have today. P A T M. T B S. <laughs> <laughs> That's, they were the first. That, they get to call it T because of that. See. <laughs> But, but that's <laughs> that's why I picked that because I had the full range. I could do whatever I wanted with it. Okay. Okay. That was a long time before anybody else offered that. Right. And they offered it in a semi-professional camera. Okay. So you didn't have to spend as much money. <laughs> yeah. And I still had a, a, it still came with the, the, the pro toys. I had a high speed winder for it. You know, you want the film, you know, to oh. wind it up. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. get all the way up there to seven frames a second. <laughs> With a 36 exposure roll, that doesn't take long. <laughs> wow, jeez. What else do you want to talk about about the modes? Anything? Well, it, it, what, once you have them all in, if, if your camera has one of these uh, custom modes, C1 or C2, and you have something that you always shoot, you know, you always go back to the same sport or the same thing set it up it's simple to set up all you do is the way it works to set it up you would make all your choices like you were going to shoot uh your whether what priority is what white balance is all your custom functions the way the camera meters the way the camera does mm -hmm. pretty much everything and every sub menu and then you go into your menu and you say assign all this stuff to c1 or c2 and that's all there is to it and then it's there whenever you want it you know, it's great if you have something that you want to flick to. Like I say, I use it for. But that's only if you shoot in a like a automatic setting, or no, it changes everything. In other words, if I so put, if you're a manual, you still shoot in manual, but it's going to give you the. In, in other words, I would set it if I'm setting up for an automatic mode. I could set it up to one one thousandth of a second for shutter priority, mm -hmm. and it would. When I turn it down at one one thousand of a second, and I'd have whatever ISO, whatever metering mode, and whatever focusing mode, and everything I see, else. I see. I see. I, I don't have to go in and change everything. Could have a different white balance, even everything. Could be. Uh, I've never used any. Could be multiple exposures. Like I say, I usually have one set up for HDR. And so that just does what? Two steps over, two steps under, yeah. one step. Yeah, two steps over, two steps under, and typically I have it set up for landscape, so I have it in aperture priority and have the aperture set for, say, F11 or something like that. Okay. And the white balance set for auto. So you put it on C1 or whatever, and you've got it all set up for HDR. Back, yeah. So you take a picture, and it automatically takes the three pictures. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and, uh, Without fussing, you know, so you don't have to go into the menu. I don't have to change the shutter prior, the mode, or the oh. metering mode, or focusing mode, or anything. Oh. I can have it set up. I should do that for HDR. Yeah. Because so you know simple. what I do for HDR because I'm lazy. I just instead of like being organized about it, 
I'll take a picture just on, you know, zero, and then I'll, mm -hmm. I'll change the shutter to go negative, and then I'll change the shutter to go positive. Yeah. I don't do it yeah. automatically. It's, I, it's, I just do it manually. It's simpler just to do it that way. Uh, when, if I had that custom function, it would be easier. When I do Milky Way photography, I usually set up, a, since it's so easy, I'll set up a uh, one for the Milky Way with uh, the proper exposure and the, the white balance I want and everything else and have it on that. And by the way, our guest today, Rob Hoovis, is going to talk about um, Milky Way photography. We're just not sure when we're going to get him on. <laughs> he wants to come on the show. We want him on the show. He lives in Fort Myers, so he's not far, but you know, we had a hurricane. so We got hit, we got hit pretty good in Fort Myers. I just got back power at uh, quarter after four like yesterday afternoon show so. off. <laughs> anyway, but Rob will be on the show to talk about Milky Way at night photography. We're hoping we can tape it this weekend because I am going away again. <laughs> I, you know what? Yeah, it's, it's, see, that's why you think it's a travel agency almost, but it's a real door office. Well, it was a fluke because I was supposed to go in May and I got postponed and now it's like there's no business. Mm -hmm. My house is a wreck, but I did as much as I can do. I have to hire people and I'm never going to find a roofer and a fencer and everything right now anyway. I'll send you mine if there's done. You got a roofer? No, not yet. I oh. want to find one. <laughs> I was going to say, you have a roofer? They're in high demand, but I'm not going to get anything done in two weeks anyway, so I may as well go on the trip. Yeah. I'm going to be broke no matter what. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to have too many people want anything. Um, now you are the president of Florida Camera, Camera Club, Club Council. Council, and you have a conference coming up. We have a conference coming up, excuse me, uh, March 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, it'll be here in Southwest Florida at the FGCU campus. Uh, we do it there during their spring break, so we have the run of the campus oh, to nice. set up. Uh, we're going to have over a dozen major name professional photographers who'll be speaking throughout the, the weekend. Uh, there will be hands-on classes, uh, there will be tours, tremendous amount of information. Uh, we'll have a ton of vendors there uh, where you can see and put your hands on the stuff, talk to their factory reps, learn about the things. Uh, it's tremendous. Uh, we did this last year. Well, we've done it for a while, but uh, we did the same similar thing last year that we're doing this year was tremendously well received. Uh, the biggest complaint I had, I had a couple people complain because there was so much stuff they couldn't get to see everything. Yeah. You know, and that's a good complaint in my mind. Yeah. You know, that they, uh, it, it was just tremendous. So, so it's a learning experience. It's entertainment. It's learning. Uh, it, it's a fantastic thing. So if you're anywhere in Florida or you're flying here on vacation that weekend on, uh, with the spring breakers and everything else, uh, by all means, you can register for this online. It's f3c.org, O-R-G. Uh, you can get an advance ticket and save some bucks, or you can wait and sign up the day of the conference. And it's, you know, hey, for you guys who don't live in Florida, it's Florida in March. It's a good time That's to right. come to Florida. It's Paradise in March. That's right. No hurricanes in March. <laughs> so you can you can say your significant other. I got a great idea. We're going to go down to Florida for a week in March, and then when she buys in or he buys in, you can say, Oh, by the way, there happens to be a photography conference down there. So. And you have two keynote speakers. Two keynote speakers. I'm very excited about both of them. Parish Mahanam, who's a Canon Explorer of Light. An amazing, you got to go on his website, Parish Kohanam. He's in Atlanta. Yeah, he's an amazing photographer. And as good of a photographer as he is, I think he's even a better speaker. Mm. I mean, the guy is, when he talks, you don't hear a pin drop in the room. Everybody is just dialed in on what he has to say. I've heard him speak a number of times, and he's just amazing. You learn a lot from him. It's very good. And then we also have, uh, uh, this conference was so big that we couldn't decide on just one keynote speaker, <laughs> so we actually have two. Uh, the other one is Max Gamez, who's a uh, Flor uh, photographer here in southwest Florida. He's a wildlife photographer. We had him at the conference last year, and he was just amazing. His spe speeches were the most attended, I think, almost of anybody, and the biggest problem we had with him was getting the people to stop asking the questions and leave the room so we could get the next group in. He's that good. 
and people would come back and listen to him over and over. He's amazing. He's a fantastic photographer, and he's a tremendous one-on-one -on -one speaker. He knows your problems because he's a self-educated, like me, he's a self-educated photographer, meaning he's made all the mistakes, so he knows what they are. By so, the way, I hate that term. What? I hate when people say I'm self-taught. Well, you're, you're, none of us are self-taught. I wasn't self-taught. Does self -taught. that mean you never took a I, class? What, it, what, it mean, <laughs> what I mean to say by self-taught is I didn't have a formal uh, series of education. You know, yeah. It was a piece here, it was a piece here, it was, oh, guess, listen to this guy, oh, listen to that guy. Well, it I wasn't a, a structured... Better, a better term would be a real-world experience. Yeah, it wasn't a structured development. It was... A lot of mistakes along the way. Don't we all? A lot of expensive mistakes along the way. Yeah. So anyway, we will have all that information. That's f3c.org for that, for the conference. Don't miss it. We're going to have all that information and the show notes on our website, which is understandphotography.com. And remember, we've got a lot of good articles on understandphotography.com, including the one about lacrosse that I talked about. Uh, a lot of people, I always give that link after I teach the class on how to shoot a manual and people really like it because it kind of, once they have the basic understanding of shooting a manual and it, it goes through my thought process, it, it's a good article. Um, so we'll be here next Friday with a recording sure. because I will be in Ireland. <laughs> The recording may be Rob Hoofus, or it may be one of the shows that Joe and I recorded today. Um, you'll just have to tune in to find out on our Understand Photography Facebook page at 4 o'clock on Friday Eastern Time. I'm Peggy Farron with Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you for watching episode number 53 of the Understand Photography Show.